We've now seen a demonstration of the Schrodinger equation and how it can help us relate to the wave-like nature of matter. And I've written it here at the top uh, just to remind us of what the form of that equation is um, because it is our first uh, entree, if you will, into quantum theory of matter. Okay, so let's take a look at this equation and begin to interpret what exactly it means. Now remember, this came from starting with a classical expression for the energy, okay, where we had energy was equal to p squared over 2m plus v of x, and this has somehow become translated into this uh, ordinary differential equation, uh, which actually uh, in higher dimensions would become a partial differential equation, but a differential equation somehow that relates this wave function psi of x, which tells us about the spatial components of matter in this particular system. Now, um, the first part is, is, I think, pretty easy. This is, uh, or maybe it's not so easy, um, but this is basically coming from the kinetic energy term. So we're going to want to relate this piece uh, in particular to the kinetic energy. So if I multiply both of these by 2m, what I basically have is something that tells me that p squared is somehow related to minus h bar squared times the second derivative of this wave function. All right, well, how can we uh, piece that together to get some kind of uh, something that tells us something about p? Well, if this is p squared, that means I must have two of these operations together. Now, what I implicitly am doing here is I am relating a classical variable to a derivative of some kind. Now, uh, the, the variable squared is equal to the second derivative here. So, in fact, what seems to be the case is that the uh, momentum itself must somehow be related, I'm going to put a little squiggle here, to the first derivative of, uh, with respect to x. But how can we uh, combine all of this stuff together? If this is two occurrences of a momentum, so in other words, if I have two momenta being uh, uh, used consecutively, how would this translate into an operation that would be translated consecutively? Well, if I have a second derivative, that suggests that I have imposed a derivative twice. So in other words, I've got a derivative and another derivative somehow that have been imposed twice. Now, I also have h bar squared. So in other words, each time I impose that derivative, somehow I must have added a factor of h bar to make this operation. Uh, but finally, I have this negative sign out here. And the only time I can get a negative sign from two successive operations, especially if they're multiplication, is if I use this complex variable i. Now, it will turn out, and I'm not going to prove it here, but what we really need to have here is negative i for these things. So if I bunch these things together, and I haven't written it very cleanly, I can relate each of these entities in parentheses to a successive operation or a successive application of momentum. So I can define, if you will, for our new wave theory that momentum is going to be interchangeable with minus ih bar ddx when I begin to describe matter as a wave. Now I'm going to identify this as an operator. And I've used that kind of language already because I can't help it. Um, but as an operator, the way I'm going to distinguish an operator, namely this thing, from a classical variable, namely this thing, is I'm going to put a little hat over the P. So whenever you see the little hat, this indicates that we have an operator or that we're talking about an operator. And if the hat is not there, then it's just a number or it's just a quantity uh, that we deal with, um, you know, in physical, you know, in physical space. Now, what would we do for a coordinate? Okay, well, it turns out coordinate is particularly easy. If I want the, um, the operator that corresponds to the coordinate, it turns out in this case, because we're in a coordinate space, that it's just a multiplication by that coordinate. So that one's pretty easy. The momentum is the only one that's, uh, at least in this particular instance, is the only one that's a little bit different. 
But this allows us to take this Schrodinger equation now, and I'm going to write it in red to really highlight this, as uh, something that's a little bit different. Okay, so I'm going to rewrite this equation like this. Okay, what I've done is I have taken these pieces together, and this implies, by putting this term over here, this implies that it's going to take the derivative of whatever follows the brackets out here. So it's going to take the derivative of this wave function. In this case, it's just a multiplication. I'm going to multiply this function times this function in order to make that happen. All right, so, uh, and then this is going to be equal to energy, which is, I'll just label it as such, it is a constant or it's a number times this wave function. All right, so this thing here has a very special role in quantum theory. This is something we call the Hamiltonian operator. Um, and it's based on a work, uh, well, it's based on classical mechanics in which we define a Hamiltonian. This, in fact, is a classical Hamiltonian for a particle moving in a potential V of x. So this is the quantum mechanical version of a classical mechanical entity. And the, the word Hamiltonian comes from a physicist, William Hamilton, who lived in the 1800s and uh, did a lot of work in, in developing classical mechanics. And uh, in fact, uh, there are some that believe that he uh, in fact, was generations ahead of his time, he came very close to uh, postulating quantum mechanics. But he was about 75 years too early. All right. So the Hamiltonian operator here is the central operator that we're going to be using in our quantum theory approach to atoms and molecules. And uh, in fact, We'll spend quite a bit of time figuring out how to define the Hamiltonian for different systems because how we define it will determine um, the wave functions that we find for matter. And in turn, it will determine the energies that we find are uh, applicable to uh, physical systems. All right, so what this turns out to be, and uh, if we want to write it in a simpler form, is an operator equation that basically says when we operate the Hamiltonian operator on some wave function, it gives us back the energy of that wave function times that wave function. So this is telling us something fundamental about the system. We have an operator, a Hamiltonian, that interrogates the wave function in various ways. In this case, it takes a second derivative and it multiplies by a potential function. Um, but once it interrogates that function, it's going to somehow give us information about the energy of that system. And so this is a way that we can translate things that we are looking at in um, matter as a wave and translate it back to the way we think about matter as particles. Now, this whole business of operators is a general business, and we're going to see lots of operators along the way. Um, so. I want to uh, familiarize yourself with more than just the ones we've looked at here. We've looked at x and x hat, okay? This is a multiply by x as the operator for coordinate position. Um, for momentum, it's take the derivative, okay? But it's minus i h bar times that derivative. And for the Hamiltonian, well, I've already written the bar over here, but the energy is going to be related to the Hamiltonian operator, and that's a more complicated operator as I've drawn up here. Okay, but uh, these operators have lots of other properties, and we're going to be talking about them in some of the coming lessons. Um, in particular, for example, if I take some operator, and I'm just going to leave it generic, um, and I operate it on a function that's multiplied by a constant, like this. It's just the constant doesn't get affected by the operator. The operator only affects functions, and it's going to convert this function into a different function. Okay, we can also have an operator operating on a, on a sum of two functions, and that would just be the sum of the individual operations. Okay. Uh, we could also have a pair of operators operating on a function. And that would just be 
the sum of the individual operations of those operators operating on those functions. So you can see operators, uh, they behave very well algebraically in most cases. The one that I'll warn you about, and we'll talk about this more, is that the order of the operators is important. So we generally do not have that this is true. In fact, when these two things are equal to one another, that indicates something special about those operators. But well, that's something more for another time. Anyway, we're going to be talking a lot about operators and their properties and studying their properties because that's going to tell us something about physical systems that will help us understand them in a deeper way um, you know, than we can classically because those systems, in fact, obey a wave equation of some sort.